Welcome! On our last episode, we were questioning why is philosophy important, but also how can you detect if you have the right kind of philosophy? And for that, one of the basic questions is, what is reality? Can we be certain that there is such thing as a one reality? And for that, I am here today with Onkar Gatt and with Harry Bingswanger from the Anne Run Institute to discuss if there is such thing as reality. Thank you very much for being with us. Ankar, do you think reality is real? Is there one objective reality that is independent from our mind? Yes. Okay. So I, there is one reality. It's the reality that we see all around us and that we have to deal with. Um, but there's a lot of views that say no. So I think the correct answer is yes, but there's views um, Religion, for instance, most religions will say that no, what's real is a mind or a consciousness God, and it's in control of reality. Reality bends to its will. Mm -hmm. um, and there, it's, there's no real reality. It's all manipulated. There can be miracles. You have to pray to this consciousness to tell it what to do, how to organize the world, grant you favors, punish your enemies. And so on. And that kind of view says, no, reality is not really real. It can be manipulated in all kinds of ways. Now, if you say that there's such thing as reality, some people may argue, okay, but that's Ankar's opinion. Why would you respond to that? That also think thinking there is one reality could also be an opinion, and maybe that's not the case. Not the case. Yeah. Not the case. Not the case in reality. Yeah. So you see that in, by asking the question, you assume there's a reality. You assume there's one reality. If I, if I say uh, Ankar's opinion is only his opinion and it's not reality, then I'm saying there is a reality and I'm in touch with it. Right. And I'm saying Ankar isn't, which uh, I'm happy to say is not true. <laughs> But, and then uh, you get into a vicious circle that never ends. Yeah, if, yeah. You, if you deny the existence of existence, Ayn Rand's axiom was existence exists. If you deny, they say, no, there isn't any existence. Not only are you denying your statement that you just made, but you're saying, here's a fact about the world. There is no world. Or if you say, we're trapped inside our minds, we can't get out to the world, you're saying, here's a fact I got out to the world about. There's my mind and there's a world and they can't communicate. So whatever you say, you're claiming that is a truth about the world. You cannot get away. Aristotle said there is one way to escape the axiom, the axiom of existence. Shut up your mouth and don't say anything and be like a vegetable then you're not contradicting the fact that your mind is going out to reality. But anything else? Okay, but we inherit this idea that there is another real world versus this world from Plato. What, Plato was the first one, right, to say like there is a, a, an ideal world where reality actually exists and, and this is just shadows, right, the myth of the cavern. But that portrays that there is a reality out there, outside of this world. Now, there is also another claim, that is, we live in our minds, but that has nothing to do with reality. What would be the two differences between this erroneous way of denying reality? Um, I'll take up the first one. So the, the Plato kind of view, there's a super reality that stands above this reality. Mm -hmm. And it, it, Christianity takes this over from Plato, this whole um, way of looking at the world. And one of the things that is important, and Rand really stresses this, is they don't give you any positive characterization of what this other dimension is supposed to be like. All it is is a series of negations. It's not material, it's not in space, it's not in time, it's not subject to cause and effect. And if you go through the whole list, it's just, it's not this, not that, not that. It's a zero. Right. It's nothing. And that's, so there is no such thing that transcends, that supernature, that transcends reality, existence, um, that things have a nature, that they, as a result of their nature, that they do what they do, so there's cause and effect. Mm -hmm. There's no, you can't get outside of that. 
And when they try to, all they say is, it's not this, not that, not that. They can never give you any positive characterization of their supposed other dynamics. Now, let me take up the second point, uh -huh. which is Descartes, really. If the first theory is, is Plato's, the two worlds uh, metaphysics. Descartes said, well, I know I have a mind. I know I'm conscious. I know I'm here. I think, therefore I am. I know I'm a thinking, questioning being. But I don't know if the world is out there. Maybe it's all an illusion. Maybe it's all a dream. But the, Ayn Rand pointed out brilliantly that a consciousness conscious of nothing but itself is a contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. Meaning, how do you have the idea of your mind except in contrast to the world? There would be no meaning to things exist only in my mind and not in reality if there weren't any reality. If your mind couldn't get out to reality and compare, oh, there's stuff like dreams that are in my mind, and then there's my waking perception of the world, and that's different. Right. So if everything, it's like saying everything is indoors. The universe is indoors. Well, what does indoors mean then? So everything's in the mind destroys the concept of mind. You can't, it's an incoherent statement. So it seems to me that when we really analyze these two erroneous uh, ways of denying reality, we come to the conclusion that those erroneous ways also derive from the same reality, yeah. either denying the things that we see in reality or uh, thinking that the mind is a little part of that reality that has nothing to do with the rest of that reality. Well, there's this uh, principle that predates Ayn Rand called reaffirmation through denial. Mm -hmm. And it's how you know you're dealing with an axiom. Well, I think what you're getting to here is you cannot deny, you cannot consistently deny reality. Okay. You cannot say, I don't accept reality. I don't know if I know reality. There is no reality. There's two realities, and the one we perceive is inferior to some other that we don't perceive. You can't say any of those things without assuming reality in the act of making that statement. Right. So you're right. You have to start as, as infants. You know, we start by perceiving the world. And when then eventually we get sophisticated, we learn the difference between mistake and not mistake at a certain age. And then we ask stupidly the question, was well, everything a mistake? Right. But it, that's, that's meaningless. It can't be that everything, you can't get away from there is something and I know it. Mm -hmm. Those are axioms inescapable. Now, okay, let, let's establish that there is not another reality, that there's this reality, that our mind can perceive it through our senses, our sight, our smell, uh, touching, um, communicating, etc. But we know, for example, that human beings are equipped with, yes, two eyes, but the way we perceive light and colors is different from other animals. So that might be tricky, or, or even mm -hmm. smells or sounds that mm -hmm. we don't perceive but other animals do. So that might be tricky for someone that says, okay, there's one objective reality, but still humanity cannot absorb it because our senses are not biologically uh, built to, for example, see x-rays mm -hmm. or UV mm -hmm. or uh, carbon dioxide in the, in, mm -hmm. on the air. So is there one reality and one truth for everybody? Like, can you say that the reality of a colorblind person is the same as someone that perceives every color? I mean, I'll take one aspect of that. It, so you brought up the list of things of how we know reality and you brought the senses, you can see it, you can hear it. But you're missing the human element, which is we have a mind that we can reason about mm -hmm. it. So I don't think there's a claim that when you say reality is objective and the truth is out there, it's not that you can perceive it literally just through your senses. There's all kinds of reasoning, logic, a whole faculty that we have of abstraction, that you can make inferences, draw principles. So the fact that we can't see certain ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum doesn't mean that we don't have ways to detect it, nevertheless. Right. But it takes a lot of reasoning, thinking, theories, and so that we can do that other animals can't do. So if you say of some particular animal, it can't perceive this and so on. 
for man, the, the mind opens up the whole universe that we can, we can infer causal connections. It ultimately has to come back to things we can see and perceive. And when you think of what scientists do in experiments and so on, it's always bringing it back to what we can perceive and detect. But it opens up the whole world. Um, that's not true of other animals. So there's it, a very different context when we're but, talking about human beings. But prior to that, that's, yeah. that's a great answer, but prior to that, the argument is, since we don't know everything, we don't know anything, uh -huh. right? Since we can't see certain parts of the spectrum, yeah. then we don't see what we see. But that's crazy. And no one would say that about a dog, right? right. You know, no one would say, well, dogs can't smell everything or dogs can't hear sounds softer than so-and-so. So -and, -so. and dogs may not have as good color vision as we do. I don't think they do, actually. So dogs' minds are disqualified. Dogs can't, can't right. perceive reality. No one would think to say that about a dog. Why did they say it about man? We perceive uh, the, the general answer to your question, which is a good, a good um, recounting of the skeptical attack on the senses, is we perceive reality in a form. We don't perceive reality know-how. We perceive uh, heat as a certain sensation. It's vibrations of the molecules, but we feel it as a certain sound, uh, as a sensation. We hear uh, vibrations of the air through our ears in a certain form, and we see vibrations of the electromagnetic spectrum within a certain range in the form of color and shape. And all those ways are valid. Now a bat, you know, sees through echolocation. He, he sends out high-pitched ultrasonic screams, and what comes back, like with radar, he uses to form an image of the thing. So he sees through sound. Yeah. That's valid, too. Of course. So all forms of, of being aware of reality are valid. The fact that they're different forms due to different sense organs in no way threatens the uh, validity of the sense organs that a given organism has. So on the one hand, they say, well, we don't know everything, so we, know, we don't know anything. And on the second, the, Ayn Rand actually characterized this argument as we're blind because we have eyes and we're deaf because we have ears. So, uh, obviously, these are a means of awareness of reality, not a barrier to awareness of reality. But, Onkar, you, you pointed out it's, it's not only the senses, but the capacity of reason. Mm -hmm. But reasoning is a choice. Even not reasoning is a decision. So can we say that there is one reality and one truth for everybody, taking into account that not everybody living on this earth is willing to make the conscious effort of reasoning? So shouldn't that create a gap of a reality for the people who actually make an effort of reasoning and putting their senses and their reason into understanding reality versus the people that, okay, they may sense with, with, with their sight or, or, or hearing, but they never use their reason to comprehend reality. Doesn't that create the fact that there is not one reality and one truth for everybody? I mean, it creates a gap, as you put it, but I don't think the gap is that the one the people who think have one truth and the people who don't think have a different truth. It's rather the people who don't think and who choose not to think, they don't reach knowledge. They have either, they're just ignorant. But then that, that's a reality. Ignorance can be a reality, no? Well, it's, it's, I think that's just an equivocation to say. It's not a reality for them. The reality is just they're ignorant of all kinds of things or they have all kinds of errors and mistaken views because they, they, they have to form certain conclusions and if they're not doing it through thinking, and through using their logic, mm -hmm. then they could arrive, if they're doing it more emotionally and so on, I think they reach all kinds of things that are false about the nature of the world. Right. But so, and you could say it's, well, their reality is they're mired in ignorance and errors, but that's just an equivocation. It's not a different, rea they're not living in a different reality. It's just they're, they've cut themselves off from the one reality that exists. Yeah, it might, it might help to use the term facts to, to make this distinction. There's, there's your, your inner state and your inner conclusions, and the people who are ignorant are living in a different 
mental world, so to speak. Right. But that world is different by their not being aware of certain facts. So say a woman has a husband who's cheating on her, on her. And she's ignorant of that. It isn't like, oh, well, things are fine in my reality. Mm -hmm. They're facts she doesn't know. And if she did know, it would make a tremendous difference. So ignorance is not bliss, is what we're saying. Yeah, but uh, you have people, for example, uh, presidents in Latin America who, when you present them facts, they say, I have different facts. <laughs> and yeah. that's how they end the AOC discussion. said that. Yeah. Said that. Uh, yeah, it, it may not be true, but it's good. You know, <laughs> she yeah. said about something. Yeah, but that's just the modern subjectivism. That's the... The, the philosophy we're fighting that makes no sense. Right. So now that we establish, okay, there's one reality, you can choose to be, um, you know, conscious that that reality exists yes. or ignorant that that reality doesn't exist, but there's one reality. Now, taking that into account, who is in control? Your environment, nature, God, or you? Like, how much of everything that is in place in reality, which aspect controls? The, the rest. Well, that's where you have to be very careful and you have to define what you can control and be in charge of that and exercise the control you can. And for the things you can't change, you can't control, you have to accept them and not fight them. What you basically can control when the uh, Ayn Rand's answered that, which was really the thing that brought me into philosophy and into her philosophy mm -hmm. is you control your mind. Yeah. You control whether you think or drift in a fog. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't think, it's not like quiet up there. There's chatter going on all the time. But it's not guided. It's not directed. So to, to exercise your real control over your life to the extent that you have it, is to direct the operations of your mind, to subject things to critical thought using logic, rather than just, you know, a stray thought comes in or somebody tells you something, you say, oh yeah, I'm real, yeah. And you just don't judge and you, you go with the flow. That is abandoning your control, not really living. You're not really living if you're doing that. The choice to live is the choice to turn on your mind. And that gives you tremendous control because your mind controls your actions. Right. We don't control the weather. We don't control what other people do. We don't control right. what other people think. That's so important to realize you don't control other people. You don't, exactly, because there are people who think that if they pray enough for their drug addict uh, sibling, magically he's gonna you know yeah. change some people are really convinced that what is in their control uh, is other people's actions other people's uh, thoughts uh, they even think that you know natural disasters are a way of supernatural beings of controlling humans so at the end there is a lot of confusion on what we can control and when we, what we can't yes. control. And it's not, it's not completely obvious in social relationships. Like a parent naturally thinks it can control its children, but they really can't. They, have to, they can supply input to the child, but the child has to make his own choices. And in a love relationship, you can't control what the, your partner does. Yeah. You know, you have to know where your boundaries are, so to speak, and control what you control, your own thinking. Let other people control their thinking. And it's, it's, so we're talking about here views about the nature of reality, and we're talking about objectivism's view that you have a fundamental power of choice and so control over your lives, over your own life. It's, if you ask why people are confused about this, and some of the examples you brought up about people praying and so it's, I think there's two dominant um, metaphysical views now that push in the other direction. So one is the kind of supernaturalism, that there's some other entity, I mean, God in some kind of form, he's characterized in slightly different ways in the different religions, who's in control. So you're not in control, he's set up a plan, you're supposed to follow it, you can't really follow it, so you need God's grace, 
And right. prayer is then, this, the attitude is, I've got to ask for favors from this being that's in control. I'm not really in control. I'm supposed to be submit, be subordinate, and if he gives me orders, obey. That's one that it takes control out of your own life. But the kind of the view that I think is dominant today in the secular world yeah. is materialism. Mm -hmm. And that's a form of determinism. I mean, it really leads to determinism that what's in control is the antecedent factors. It's not some entity in some other dimension in control. Right. It's the past that's in control of your life. And it will be cached as its nature or nurture or some combination. And you brought up the example of the parent thinking, well, if, it's, if I could just manipulate maybe his genes a little bit and his environment, I can get him to do what I want him to do because I've set up the antecedent factors and now inexorably this is what the person will do. And it ignores the fact that people have choice. So both those views that I think are the two dominant metaphysical views yeah. take power away from the individual because they say you don't have a fundamental uh, chosen control over what you do. But, uh, and that is something that uh, for, for religion it's absolutely contradictory. For example, when, when a kid gets cancer, if he gets cured, oh thank God he got cured, but if he dies, it's like, no, God him want him by his side. Right. So no matter what the outcome is, there's always some supernatural plan where God always wins, even, even if the kid lives or the kid dies. Now, on, on, on that premise, there's also the concept of free will. So when, when things go wrong, you are the sinner and you used your free will to go against God's plans. But if you act properly, then you are following the plan. So it's like when you really think about it, it, it it's also contradictory, that, that religious view. And in the secular view, it's like, okay, yes, there's nurture, and nurture is more important than your own decisions. So if you are born a woman in the Middle East with Muslim religion, your chances of you know, being someone in the world get diminished. But then you find women or, or, or girls like Malala who break that rule. So constantly you're seeing that those two views that you are not in control of your life eh, are by, by the same reality are always being shown as erroneous, but still people follow them. Why is it so hard for, for people to understand that the only thing that they are, have control of is, is their own thoughts and their own actions? Well, first of all, that's a new view. It's, it didn't exist before about 1957. It was never stated. No one ever stated before Ayn Rand that your basic choice is to use your mind to think rationally or not. So that's one thing. Another thing is if you make the wrong choices, if you choose to be passive, if you, it, it's not like you choose it consciously, but if you just let go right. and go with the flow, you'll feel after years of that that you had no choice. You never exercising a choice to run your own mind it's unfamiliar to you and you, you will say, yeah, of course I believe what I believe because of my culture or my genes, because you're not even familiar with the other possibility. So uh, how can a person control his life and his future, understanding that these are like the predominant ways uh, of perceiving or even denying reality? Well, one of the things I think which Harry brought up about, this is part of what impressed him about Ayn Rand when you first read her, and it impressed me as well. It's that she says you have the power of choice and it's the power to set your mind in motion, to engage it, to start thinking, to start grappling with things. Even if you don't get the answer immediately, um, you have this power and this control over which nobody can say, don't think. Um, the only thing they can do is blow to your head, like take a club to your head and stop you from thinking. But if they don't do that, if they're not forcing you, you can think whatever your social environment is, yeah. if you have bad parents, if your school is bad or boring, you can take charge of your mind and of your ideas and so ultimately of your life. And it's an enormously empowering viewpoint that you have this control. It's her famous quote of, uh, the question is not who's gonna 
led me, but who's going to stop who's me? Who's going right? to stop me? Yeah, yeah. I think you, to begin with, it, it, the practical question of how do I take control is start questioning all the moral doctrines that you've been pounded with over, you know, start questioning, do I really have to do the things that people say I have to? Or do I really have to take care of my sick cousin? Do I really have to stay in the town that I'm living in now? Why? Why do I have to do that? Do I have to uh, agree with everyone around me to not make waves? You know, the things that people are told. Uh, because the answer is no, you don't. You can define yourself, you can create yourself, you choose your own values. So decide what is meaningful to you in life. To you, not because somebody told you that this was a meaningful thing in life. And there the book, The Fountainhead, is the best inspiration. It's a story of two people, essentially, Howard Rourke and Peter Keating. One of them is the independent thinker, and the other is the conformist and it shows what happens to both. So that's what you would recommend uh, for people watching this interview yes. if they're interested in knowing more, reading The Fountainhead. Something else, Ankar? Um, well, I'll, I'll give another of the novels, Atlas Shrugged. Mm -hmm. And the part of that whole story is the importance of free will and the kind of control you can get over your own mind and as a result over your own life. And it also has these kinds of contrast, and if you just pay attention, there's a brother and sister, Dagny and Jim, who um, have very similar upbringings and so, and have very different paths. And you see at a very deep level that one has a commitment to really thinking and questioning things, and the other rebels against that kind of effort. And that's you were asking about sort of different cultures and so. Um, there are cultures that are very pro-effort and pro-thinking, and there are cultures yeah. that aren't. And you can see that in individual people, and you really get that in Atlas Shrugged, that you can embrace the fact that knowledge and having values takes work, or you can rebel against the fact that it takes effort and work. I, you know, there's one thing that we need to say here in the context of free will control over your life, and that's the issue of emotions. I think it was in the movie Lawrence of Arabia, mm -hmm. which is about um, the fatalistic attitude of the Arabs versus the English idea of free will. And one of the characters says, you can do what you want to do, but you can't want what you want to want. Okay. Meaning, if, you want, if you've got the motivation to do something, you can go ahead and do it. But if you wish you wanted to do X, but you don't, you can't change that. So that like your motivation is not in your control. But emotions come from value judgments. Emotions are not given by genes. They're not implanted in you by uh, your peers or your parents. Emotions come from what you think is for you or against you. It comes from a conclusion of your mind that you've automatized and stored in your subconscious. And you can change that if you change your conscious beliefs. It doesn't happen automatically in most cases. It takes time. But you can, you can want what you want to want if you have reasons for wanting it, wanting to want it. You go over those reasons in the abstract and in the concrete, and you will begin to want it. All right. So the Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, some, some more uh, suggestions for our audience if they want to, to keep on questioning. Yeah, questions. yeah. There's a great article called Causality versus Duty, okay. which is in Philosophy Who Needs It, a collection of short essays by Ayn Rand that's ava widely available, Amazon and everywhere. Um, it, in it, she defends the point that you have no unchosen obligations. 
You're not born with any duties imposed upon you. Your only obligation is to your own values for, for the sake of living your own life. That is a very liberating essay to read. All right, Ankar, something else? Yeah, I'll give, so from the, again, from the nonfiction now, she has an essay, we started off this conversation about, um, or midway through about what's in your control, what isn't, and that it's important to have both categories, that there's things you can't change and things that you can. Right. She has an essay in the book, Philosophy, Who Needs It? But the essay is called The Metaphysical Versus the Man-Made. Yeah. And it's all about the, the, how to properly make this distinction between these are the things I can change, this is what I have control over, this is what I don't, or only indirect control over. And the way she has all kinds of very interesting examples of the ways people go wrong in regard to this, that they put too much stock into tradition, um, that they beat themselves up for errors that they made, that there's no reason to think you could have avoided this error. And so, right. and so there's all kinds of ways that you can really ruin your life, and good people, I think, do, because they don't have these categories as real, distinct categories. Well, thank you very much, Harry and Ankar, for, for this enlightening uh, session. And if you want to hear more, well, you know, go and read these essays and books all available in the Anran Institute. And if you want to follow up on these episodes, subscribe to the channel of the Anran Institute. See you soon.